Hey, Ami, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Neil? I'm good. I've been hearing about your company for a couple of years. And uh, now also with uh, some new announced, announcements that we're going to talk about. But before we dive into the company, the bigger vision and all the amazing things that you guys are doing there, I want to know about you, even before the company. Give us a little bit of a background. First of all, uh, it's just such a pleasure to be here. Hopefully next week, next year we'll do this uh, FinTech week in person. Uh, but, but, yeah. but who knows, right? Um, and uh, um, it's just about me. I'm 37 years old. I'm married. I have two kids. Um, uh, before the company, I was, I've been an entrepreneur since I was 16. Uh, so I learned the gift of class. Uh, and I had to be the best in things. And I wasn't the smartest. So I thought I'd be, go and be the best in, in, in building stuff. So I ended up with a couple of partners uh, building a Jewish, Arab, Jewish Orthodox community center in my hometown. Uh, and raising about a million bucks uh, for that uh, purpose. Uh, and 20 years in, they're still working, you know, super successful. People are happy. All, all, all I'm doing right now is just, I'm, you know, I have a sign on the wall, but that's it. Um, so that when I was a teenager, I joined the wow. Navy. I served as a Naval officer. And then I uh, built another NGO for empowerment of disempowered youth across the country. It's also it has been embedded into. Uh, that network of schools. Um, uh, then my ship got hit by a missile in 2006. I got the hint. I left the Navy. I have a law degree because you know you need to, you, make, you need you need to make your mom happy. Um, you don't want to mess with your mom ever. Uh, and uh, in the last 10 years or so, my partner and I have been and our team have been building this company, which I'm super excited now because this is probably the inflection point in our life. But more on that in a bit. Yes, so tell, tell us about the, the company. By the way, I just want to mention even before that we have Michael Eisenberg also on the summit, uh, speaks uh, highly of you and, and the team. And uh, by the way, other Aleph uh, companies that are, are joining now. Um, so uh, yeah, let's, let's continue from, from Aleph and what you're doing uh, over there. Yeah, so, so maybe let me use, maybe let me use uh, Michael Eisenberg, which I literally spoke an hour ago. Uh, maybe tell, tell you a bit about our story. So when you speak to Michael, oftentimes he says that he invests in people and visions. And, and to some extent, when Matan, my partner and I started building this company about 10 years ago, we may have been a bit ahead of, ahead of the curve, uh, just maybe. Because when we built this company, we thought, hey, there's this boom, big ocean. There's ships going around. And a lot of people care about the 90% of the world's trade as transport on the sea. And there's a bunch of interest in people who need that, uh, which is quite a, quite a big value proposition and problem statement, if you will. And throughout the years, we built more and more products, but actually all, all, almost pivoted from one product line to the second evolved. And it took us a while to uh, maybe uh, play catch up with reality or the market uh, to where, where we are now, which I think is actually the inflection point. And I'll try to connect that also to the, to the FinTech week with the UAE. So broadly what we do, we're trying to build the best company in the world that combines data science and shipping and provides forecasting risk management decision support for anybody who touches that the right thread of trade on the seas. So out of the $12 trillion of trade, 95% is transport on the seas, 7 trillion containers, 5 trillion in wet and dry box. What we build is a platform to figure out everything about the ships, the companies, and the cargoes, connecting the dots and helping you take better decisions. And we can take it a level down or two or three, however, however you'd like, actually. Wow. So I, I like that you, you shared some, uh, some numbers in this uh, crazy market. And, uh, you know, it's, it's huge. Like uh, making a decision here is so critical and uh, it turns out to be a uh, a decision of so so many millions, you know, uh, they, like it's crazy, right? Yeah, which is well, by the way, and, and I think part of the charm in this market. So so we we spoke um, I spoke with some colleagues last week, and they they compare what we do to cyber insurance, and I think it's two opposite end of the spectrum. So cyber insurance, friends, is actually all the cyber world, is pretty new. So there's been this new domain called cyber, and people finding these new needs in this huge new domain. Basically, marine is exactly the opposite. Marine is old. It's 
so one of the oldest professions in the world. Um, and, and I think it goes back to the story of founding Lloyds of London. Do you know that story? Do you want to talk about that story a bit? Yeah, yeah, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. So 300 years ago in the Lloyds coffee shop in London, um, you had a bunch of people who met, and, you know, drank tea, probably, actually not coffee, because they were British, and said, listen, um, we have these gold cargoes from the new world, they were trading globally. What are we going to do if something stinks? Some, and one of them said, oh, you know what? How about insurance? Let's build insurance. And then they said, yeah, but it's too expensive. None of us can do it by themselves. And this is how commercial insurance was invented, as marine insurance. And they said, why don't we share the risk? That's what's called subscription insurance. Then they turned to the right and said, yeah, but how would we finance that? So the marine insurance is called, it's called Lloyd's of London. And then they would finance it via something that's called Lloyd's Bank, which will finance the first bank shipping deals and trading deals. And then they say, well, but how will we know which ships are good enough to sail? And then they built Lloyd's Register, which is something that's called a class assignment. And then they say, well, if we know who can sail, how will we know which ships are in the world and who owns what? And then they built Lloyd's Register of Ships. And then they said, but how will we know of all these deals and what's happening? And they built Lloyd's List, which is a newspaper. And since that day 300 years ago, not many things have changed until now. And now you're in 2020 and you have a few mega trends that boom, collide. First of all, you have globalization, obviously, but then you have COVID, which, which what happens is it makes a lot of supply chains collapse because you can't import, export, you know, a lot of tier two, tier three, tier four providers, you can talk about that, vendors. When you buy a coat, you actually have a tier four provider you don't even know exists, you know, that does the buttons in Cambodia or in Vietnam or some something. You buy from Marks and Spencer, but they have multiple vendors. So yeah. a lot of these small ones absolutely collapse. Then you have a lot of delays. It's the worst year in record of reliability of liner shipping ever in record. Um, so therefore you have co collapsing of supply chains, but then you also have this huge mega geopolitical issue where sanctions are becoming a legitimate thing for everyday, you know, uh, 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 conflict. And then you have the number of the use of sanctions grew like 64 times, I think in the last couple of years. Uh, so you have a lot more sanctions, but specifically you had the US and the UK apply new sanctions regulations and shipping and trading, which never existed. And now let's take it back to banks and trading. So now you have these banks, FinTech, right? right? You have the type of banks. And you have all their ecosystem, what they call the corporates, which means energy traders, energy companies like Adnoc or Enoch or Shell or BP or Saudi Ramco, all these guys. The commodity traders, the guys like Vitom, Mercuria, Trafigura, um, and obviously the respective uh, 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 um, storage capacity providers who provide storage for oil, because oil was at a low time. Uh, all time low four months ago. So, so there are players. And all these guys have to deal with collapsing of supply chains and a lot more regulation and technology at the same time where they can't even meet people in person. Does that make sense kind of as a setup to how I see the world? Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm sorry to uh, connect a few dots here. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, sometimes you need to, to stop and see the, the bigger picture and hear all these details and the accumulating all of them into this scenario, a huge scenario, it's, it's unbelievable. And, uh, and yeah, and all the data together and all the, the opportunity here. Tell me about the last, uh, last partnership that, uh, that you did. Yeah, so, so we, we announced last week a new partnership with Danske Bank um, in Denmark, you know, and one which, which I think are one of the most advanced um, uh, institutions in the financial world today. In terms of compliance, as as insofar as compliance is uh, um, is uh, concerned, and actually, when people say compliance, I want to I want to kind of double click on that. It's not really just compliance. So when banks look at our platform, and that's that's also the case with Danske Bank as well. Um, 
it's not just compliance. It's actually across the board. It's first of all, how do you, when you onboard a new corporate, okay, how do you do proper KYC for that? So that's when the onboarding part. And then there is what's called the front office back office. When they actually do the trading deals and you provide this size of a letter of credit, it's called an LC. Yeah. How do you do the risk analysis for that? Because you have so many deals happening. How do you narrow it down to I should look at these two deals? Um, we'll talk about hidden Leong in a second because we think it's an important, important use case that happens in America. Sorry, in, in, in Asia back. Um, so there's front office back office. And then you have first, second, third line of defense, which are models that, that showed up or popped up in the last 10, 15 years. Then you have financial crime, AML, and sanctions compliance. So actually, we don't just work with compliance teams and banks. We provide technology and, and artificial intelligence to help them do their work better across the board. Do, do you want to talk a few words about Hin Leong, maybe? Did you hear, uh, hear about Hin Leong? No, I, I haven't. Uh, but I think this is fascinating what you're saying because it's opened up a whole new market here of banks who can do it. And it's like, I don't know how they do it without it. Like, uh, so, I, so the answer is, first of all, they do it manually because the, the, the world where we come from, we're an AI company. We've always been, that's our DNA. And we can talk about trust in AI because I think it's a really important subject not, not many people talk about. Um, but, but basically they do it manually. They buy data from data publishers like they've been doing. Remember, remember the Lloyd's Register of Chip, the book? They do the same, only now it's online. That's the only difference. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, if you talk about banks, the problems in sanctions compliance, the thing, and specifically in the UAE, there's been a bunch of uh, international third-party reports about the ecosystem in the UAE and the fact that there's a lot of money laundering to the extent that the UAE government is pushing a lot of the banks to double down and triple down on financial crime and AML because they don't want to be pushed out of the international community as a hub for that. Exactly. Um, and, and I think in that sense, uh, the Hin Leong case really stands out and what I'm trying to tell is the story. So I think the way, right way to pronounce it is Hin Leong because they're Chinese originally. Hin Leong. So Hin Leong was a trader, commodity trader in Singapore that uh, committed fraud and collapsed completely about four months ago. And it triggered a domino effect to the tune of, of right out uh, write-offs of 700 million bucks of loans, bad loans, obviously, that HSBC, AB and AMRO, Citibank, Barclays, and so forth provided them. Because of Hin Leong, AB and AMRO, which is a huge Dutch bank, does a lot of business in the Oh, they're right? very good, yes. Pulled out of trade finance almost completely and fired 1,200 people two months ago. Because what they felt is that the risk and return in trade finance became unbalanced. So it's hard to find good deals in trade finance. It's a commoditized product, but at the same time, they couldn't find a way to control the risk ahead. So to your question, how did they do it? The answer is like they did 300 years ago, and yes, now it's not good enough. And after Hin Leong, there was another case in Hong Kong, I think. And now what happened last four or five months to get with COVID, a lot of the credit was crunched and stopped for commodity traders. And that that caused the big ones to survive, but the mid small tiers, a lot of them collapse because if you take out the credit line for your 30 man shop, it's not like a, you know, a, credit, a revolving credit facility for 1200 people. Am I making sense kind of about what happened? Definitely, wow. Um, and the reason it didn't happen by the way is, uh, have, you, have you ever heard the term uh, value at risk? No, tell me. So value at risk is, um, is really affiliated, affiliated with the Enron case in the US. Hmm. So, so long story short, value is risk. When you close the books every night, what is your value at risk? Which means how much money is out right now being traded and, and you know you, can, you might lose all your money and, and shut down the firm. And then there's became all this risk management world to limit the value of risk. So what happened because of the volatility, the huge volatility of oil prices, for instance, it became really hard to predict the value of risk because VAR is not really built for you know, oil going down from 60 to 17 bucks in 45 days. So this is a year where commodity traders, which are actually the corporates, the banks finance, made a lot of money because of the volatility. Those of them will survive. But also it's a year 
with, with huge write-offs of a lot of the banks, which caused a lot of pushback and a lot of crunch of credit facilities. So if you take all of that, COVID, supply chains, um, digitalization in banks, sanctions compliance, uh, the FinCEN leaks, third-party reports on the UAE and that area require much more AML and kind of prime attention. And you combine them together with AI, that's why we're really excited to take part in this conversation with FinCEN. Like, does that make sense? Amazing. Now I understand uh, also uh, why are you flying? Uh, I heard you flying to the UAE as a part of a delegation. Uh, uh, yes, there's, there's, a, there's an in-person conference. What is that? What is that? <laughs> Can we even do that anymore? So uh, on December uh, 7th onwards, called GTEx. It's uh, uh, sponsored by Banco Poalim from Israel. And I think we're super excited because, so we had, we had customers in golf for years now, years, like five or six years. But for us, it's such an amazing opportunity to take all of this a notch up because actually, first of all, we're close. We're close in culture. We're close physically, close, and, yeah. and Three hours. Probably, our, probably our destinies are also um, much closer to each other than any, anybody else. And I've seen, I've worked a lot of years already with, with our golf partners. And I think, A, they're super thoughtful and knowledgeable. And B, maybe even more than a lot of Western, very distributed firms, they execute like no, uh, no other people in the world I've seen. So the decision making process is different. Sometimes it's much faster. And once they decide, boom, it's done perfectly. And I think that's something we as a, as a nation, we as a culture can learn from. Amazing, Ami. Uh, you know, I can talk to you uh, hours. It's, uh, it's wow, wow. It's un, and, and your company is ready. It's mature. It knows it's focused. So I totally understand that, that your visit over there will, will be meaningful. And will be, you know, as we say in Israel, tachles. It will be very uh, uh, direct, and uh, and I understand exactly also the bigger vision more than more than just uh, the summit that you're flying. The bigger vision of your company now becomes more and more realistic, and and this is the future. You know, having these a a AIs, um, it, there's no way back. Like this is the only way of of, uh, of doing this. You mentioned some of the leading banks uh, in in the world. Uh, I know them uh, in person in different other different departments, but uh, I, I know, by the way, in the Netherlands, in the past, you had lots of uh, issues with, with the banks because you mentioned the Netherlands, and that's a market I'm, I'm close yeah. to. So, uh, by the way, do you, uh, your offices are in Israel or other places? Uh, we have offices in Tel Aviv, in London, New York, Washington, D.C., and San Francisco, and soon to be in Singapore. So we're really going to make a push in the next 12 months to the financial markets and having people on the ground branch markets. So I appreciate Zoom works and video works, but still we wanna be closer to our customers, same time zone, uh, same culture. Uh, and these are, this, the opportunity is so big, but maybe, maybe one point I'd like to emphasize, maybe just to wrap up is, I think it's a, still a journey. So when using AI and trusting AI, a lot of the challenge is the work processes, the workflows, and winning the hearts and minds of the teams. And it's not like, it's, it's not a panacea. It's not to say, hey, take this AI, it's gonna solve your problems. That's bullshit, sorry, part of my French. Uh, I think the key is how do you structure your workflows, your culture, um, and the hearts and minds of the people, and use AI to make that 10X more effective. And that requires leadership, and therefore the one parameter I ask, with every team and every prospect I, I, I meet, and some of them we feel it's not a good fit, so we just back off is do we share the same culture with the leadership? When I look in the eyes of the CEO, CFO, COO, and I always work, I always work with somebody personally on the other side with the C-level, um, I ask myself and ask him actually, do we share the same culture and vision? Do we want to see our organizations march together to the same future? Do we, do we both have the courage? Because you're not perfect and we're not perfect. We're going to learn a ton from you. Maybe we can add our two cents. And, and when the answer is no, then we walk away. When the answer is yes, you can double and triple down. And that's the partnership which are more, more successful. And, and that's why I'm so excited to be speaking with you this week, to be uh, participating in person in GTEx in, um, in, uh, in Dubai uh, in a couple of weeks. And that's why I'm so, so excited for the Abraham Accords and what, what these two people can do together.
Amazing. Your lessons are, are so good for, for so many other companies that I'm interviewing here during this week. I mean, uh, you totally uh, get it. And this is, this is the way of building trust and relationships. You failed so many times. So, you know, like, uh, I learned just a bit. I still have a lot more to do. How can people uh, follow you, get in touch with you, with opportunities, partnerships? Yeah, like I think, first of, all, first of all, on LinkedIn, Ami Daniel, uh, Winward. I think there's one guy, but I'm not sure there's another guy. LinkedIn called Ami Daniel. So that's that's the easiest way. Uh, website, WNWD.com or email AMI at WNWD.com. You know, Google me, ping me. Today, it's all the same. So I'd love to be in touch. Amazing. I'm, I'm going to, after this week is over, I'm going to send this talk to some of the, the banks uh, here on the summit to listen up to some of the, the lessons. And, uh, and I think... Uh, your, your product and what you have to offer is super relevant to our FinTech Week. So I'm very, very happy. Again, I got recommended to talk with you from several people. Thank One you. of them is Aleph and of course, uh, Michael Eisenberg. Uh, and then I learned about uh, the last uh, partnership deal and, and uh, maybe we're gonna do a follow-up interview after the, your visit to the UAE uh, to follow up on Let's do your it. journey. And, 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 I, and if we do it, I can really tell you like a couple of things I learned during the visit. Because, you know, if there's one thing that I try to do is I try to learn every day something new. Um, so I, I'd love to do that and, and come back to you with what I learned from the visit and how we can be better. So great. Let's do it. Nia, thanks for having me. It's been a Thank pleasure. Thank you very much. Take Cheers. care. Bye-bye.